Hey all, welcome back. Cheers. We got an official Bridgerton season two announcement. We knew it was coming based on the numbers that season one was pulling. They would have been silly not to. They've been teasing all eight stories and what have you, but we got it officially and that was a lot of fun. So I thought that we would continue, well, I would continue my chat about Bridgerton specifically in what I would like to see in season two, specifically in relation to the book, The Viscount Who Loved Me, that of course being book two in the Bridgerton series and Anthony's book as season two has been confirmed to be his season. So I still have not read book three, which is Benedict's book. So I don't have how we're sweeping out of the season, but don't worry, I'm gonna have plenty to babble on, especially in relation to the show-ish and what we have established in season one. Clearly there are already differences in the show versus the book. So those are gonna be things that we're gonna have to navigate in the show, but there are clearly things from the book that most readers want to see in the show. And there are things that I personally really want to see in the show because I can only speak for myself at the end of the day. So if you have other thoughts, sure, leave them below and let's chat about it. I haven't, you know, been as active. I, I saw that there's already like a Reddit and all kinds of stuff for this. So it's been a joy to see this fandom grow and to see the love of this series grow because it's like welcoming people into something that has been nostalgic from not nostalgic but something that has brought me a lot of joy since I was a teen and I've still been reading all of of Julia Quinn since you know the Bridgertons ended so it's 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 really nice to see that world expand and I have talked to lots of people in my life who aren't traditional romance readers who've really gotten into the show. So I think it's opening up a wider audience. I'm gonna move my gloves and my hat, cause it's winter. Um, so yeah, so I obviously chatted a little bit about the about book two in my last video. So book two follows the next season where we sweep out of season one of Bridgerton. We get that little inkling of Anthony planting the seed that he's going to be on the hunt for a wife. Which, so the book picks us up in the next season, social season, if you will. And we meet a new family in town, the Sheffields, if I am pronouncing that correctly. I know I mispronounced Francesca last video and thank you to the person who corrected me on that because I want to say it correctly. Who knows if she'll be around, how much she'll be around this season. But we have this new family in town. They are not as wealthy. They've had to postpone Kate, the older sister season, to coincide with the younger sister Edwina's season. And Kate is actually a step sibling. So Kate and Edwina are stepsisters and Mary is Kate's stepmother. Will become pertinent in my kind of view. And Anthony is on the hunt for a wife. Lady Whistledown is kind of peppering through the papers that his status and really upplaying his rakishness. So that really puts Kate on edge right away. She wants nothing to do with Anthony Bridgerton. She wants her sister to have nothing to do with Anthony Bridgerton. And it is established very early that Edwina is the belle of this season, the diamond of this season. Everyone is after her hand, but she has made it very clear that whoever she ends up with has to kind of get the stamp of approval from Kate because they're so close. So Anthony wants Edwina's hand because she is the diamond of the season and he wants the best and he expects absolutely no emotional attachment from this. He wants absolutely no emotional attachment because as we know from well, we don't, I guess, if you haven't, but he is convinced he's going to die young. His father died very suddenly and tragically from what we presume is an allergic reaction to a bee sting. So he has kind of internalized this idea that one, bees can kill you, and two, 
he is going to die young because his father was his hero. His father died as he was coming into his own, into his majority, around 18, I think. And in Anthony's mind, he cannot outlive this man who stands so solid in his memory. So there is a lot of grief there. And so in his courtship of, of Edwina, if you will, he crosses paths with Kate and they do not get along. Kate is very headstrong. She's very well-spoken. She stands up for herself and she's gonna tell it like it is. So she challenges him. So if you like hate to love type banter, this is gonna be right up your alley. I really think that this takes the Bridgerton banter to the next level. And the Bridgertons are known for their banter. We got to see a little bit of that in the show. And I think the translation from the page to the, to the screen, that's part of why this worked so well. But I felt almost like that was even, it was even held back a little bit. And that could just be because I was, I always want more banter. I think that Daphne and Simon's banter was there and was fun. But I think that this really puts it to the next level. And I think that it's interesting because they are both oldest, eldest siblings. Sure, Anthony has a bajillion siblings and he is the head of the household and dealing with what being the head of the household means. But in a lot of ways, Kate is, is facing being the elder sister, wanting the best for her, her sister, knowing that her sister in a lot of ways is gonna be responsible for saving the family. And Edwina feels that way as well. She just wants to marry a scholar. She's a nerdy, bookish little beauty. And I love that it challenges that conception, right, of what a beautiful, popular young woman is. Because Edwina gets to be a, a full swath, just as Kate gets to be a full swath. So I think with that, you know, there's a lot that's outside of Kate's purview and outside of her control, even as she's so used to having control. She's having to give up a lot of control in this time of her life, and that's hard. So that's where a lot of the tension comes to, and she's used to being the oldest. She's used to protecting, and that's what she's trying to do here. So that butts heads with Anthony a little bit. And there's a great line that Kate has that I think, you know, kind of helps establish that commonality between the two of them as being the eldest. She says, let me pull it up, but I am her older sister. I have always had to be strong for her, whereas she has only had to be strong for herself. And there's no judgment there. There's no sense of any wrongness to that, but there's just this truth and this idea that she has to stay strong for others. And I think that that swings us around to the mental health aspect of this book and the emotional depth of it. So I I think I talked about this in my last video as well, about the Bridgertons, but I've seen in interviews where Jonathan Bailey, the actor who plays Anthony, talks about how he is approaching this and this character from a, more of a mental health angle and what Anthony is kind of struggling with and going through. And I think that that makes sense. I mean, obviously he's not playing mental health because that's not an active objective that you can play, but that confliction, that tension within the character, that pot of emotion in the stomach, if you will, I don't know where I was going with that, but it is a tension and a conflict, an internal conflict to play. And I think, you know, both of these characters are dealing with something traumatic in their past that they have suppressed for whatever reason and is presenting itself in different ways that they have to grapple with as they engage in this relationship and get to know each other. So it's very much the romance, but it's also the complexity of, of these emotions and this grief. If we get the flashbacks for Anthony that we got for Simon, if they do them correctly, and, and for Kate's as well, if we get them, they have the potential to be absolutely gutting. And I think that there is a great wealth of room to play within that because I this, this book, 
I don't remember it being my favorite when I first read this series, but of the books I've reread, the three, <laughs> this is a, this is without a doubt my favorite. There, there's just a lot of tension and there's there's a lot of juxtaposition, right? So we have the juxtaposition of the upstanding heads of the house, the upstanding heads of the household with their own internal conflict that they've suppressed. We've got that juxtaposition of the hate to love banter conflict with a really beautiful softness that starts to develop as the as the book and hopefully as the series progresses. And then we've got the juxtaposition of the Bridgertons, who we have at this point firmly established. In season one, we obviously have the Featheringtons as a foil to the Bridgertons as a family unit. But I think with the Sheffields and Kate and Edwina and Mary, what this presents is this beautiful example of more of a found family. Like sure, Mary is her stepmother, Kate's stepmother, but there is this beautiful relationship with the, with these characters wherein they are unquestionably a family, right? They care for each other, they look out for each other, they have each other's best interests at heart. And it's this wonderful way to put them up against the Bridgertons who are these tight, close-knit blood family and Kate's family is just as established and Mary cares about Kate so much. And there's just a, a really gorgeous scene between the two of them in like the last third of the book that when played out, I think will be astounding. Also in terms of the family, the, the groundwork that's been laid between Anthony and Violet, Lady Bridgerton, in the first book season like that episode with Anthony episode that scene with Anthony in the study where his mom kind of just calls him out on his shit <laughs> is one of my favorites in the entire season I think that there is just a lot going on in that scene and I'm sure it was it was a delight to play as actors and I think this whole book season will kind of hopefully feel like that because Lady Bridgerton knows I think from the beginning where this is going right she knows her kids so there are a lot of moments in this book and a lot of things from this book that I'm really excited for I want to see in the show so what are some of them Pall Mall which based on the description and the very rudimentary google I've done I assume is like a version of croquet and the Bridgertons are very competitive in their Pall Mall. Also, house party. This has a house party. Who doesn't love a house party? To all our new romance fans, you're in for a treat. We love a house party. So Kate and Edwina get pulled in, if you will, to a Bridgerton family game of Pall Mall. And this is the Bridgertons like we've never seen them. We've seen them be cutting to each other and, and teasing and whatnot. And here we get to see them be cutthroat competitive and they will fight to the death over this Paul Mall game. And Kate will throw down just as well. She fits in perfectly. For fans of the Bridgerton book series, this is one of the most defining scenes in the book. So I can't imagine this doesn't make it in the show in some form. I think I caught a reference to it potentially in the first season. I think that there's a line between Anthony and Gregory, I believe. Let me know if I'm wrong. I'm, you know. So this is some of the most fun the book is. And it's a lot of character work that also can be established in a really fun, entertaining way. So I can't imagine this scene doesn't make it in. I think it would just be a mistake if it didn't. Speaking of famous scenes, the B scene. Spoilers, spoilers, spoilers. If you've made it this far and haven't expected spoilers or don't want spoilers, sorry about it. We know that Anthony is afraid of bees. His father died from a bee. This is established. Which leads us to one of the more famous scenes in the Bridgerton series, as well as romance in a lot of ways. I feel like this this scene 
gets referenced. So they're hanging out in the garden. Anthony and Kate are finally warming to each other through the magic of the house party. One of the ways that has she started to cool is she sees Anthony stand up for Penelope with Cressida. And so that's like also the firmening of Cressida's mean girl reputation. We'll see a little bit more Penelope there, hopefully. But she's, she's warming up to him. So they're in the garden. I don't even know what they're doing. I don't remember. They're talking. And a bee stings her. And Anthony loses his ever loving mind. Ever loving mind. And it stings her like on her breast, chest area. And he like attacks her. <laughs> Had they kissed already at that point? I don't remember. Someone tell me, I'm sure. I just read this book this month. This is, my brain is just not doing great right now. Stress does that to you. You don't remember things as well. So anyway, so he attacks her chest with his mouth, which as you can imagine, isn't a great idea. Like we've already seen Daphne forced into, forced, you know, have to get married because she was compromised. And here we are in a garden at a house party. And sure enough, Violet and Mary and Mrs. Featherington happen upon them. And that is a delight in and of itself because Mrs. Featherington wants, she has the gossip now, like the gossip. And Anthony is like, you will not, <laughs> you will not. So that's fun. But obviously like we know where that ends. So It, I remember it being funnier, obviously, because I was more separated from the angst of Anthony's angst. So I think that that scene probably won't be played as funny in the show. The actors are going to add the depth they're going to add, but I can't imagine it won't be at least a little bit funny. I mean, we'll see what mood they put on top of it with the music, but it's going to be at least a little bit funny, especially because Kate's reaction is really what's gonna play that scene, I would, I would assume. Again, I'm not an actor making the acting choices in this moment, but that's what I would assume. So that between Paul Mall and that scene, those are like two of the more famous scenes in the book that I hope and assume would also make it to the show. Cause like I said, those are pretty infamous Bridgerton scenes across the series. Okay, and now for my, no, it's not a deep cut, but it is one of my favorite things. We get the first reference to a Smith Smith musicale. I don't know if it's musical or musicale, but I'm gonna say it musicale as if I'm in a high school musical. And the Smith Smith musicale is like my favorite, one of my favorite things. I was really hoping the first season's trailer, I, I couldn't remember if we had a Smith Smith musicale in the first book musical uh, anyway so my dream first trailer first season trailer was kind of starting out with the typical melodious beautiful looks of what we kind of expect from a period piece and then hitting a discordant note and moving into like a much more jarring piece and and really delving into the world and that all being underscored musically by the jarring part by a Smith Smith musical because in this world the Smith Smith concerts are not good they're not good everyone's always trying to get out of them often they don't and they get their own spin-off series so love it and also potential for spin-offs but in this book we get we know that Edwina made it plain at the Smith Smith musicale that Kate's opinion was going to be necessary or good opinion was going to be necessary when she was selecting a husband. So that very important moment happens. And granted, we don't see the action of it. It's just referenced, but we at least get a reference and I will take that. I don't, I obviously haven't read Benedict's book yet. So I don't know if we get a musical there. I know we get one in book four. So it's all about the Smith Smiths and their gosh awful concerts and just the humor of them and the delight and the idea that all of these people go to these 
awful concerts that they know they're gonna hate and just do it. So I love the Smith Smiths. Any reference we get to them is great. I do know, I read somewhere that the creators are aware of their existence. So hopefully, hopefully we'll get something there. Banter, we've talked about, and I've talked about the juxtaposition that this book and season offers us, the potential that is there. I'm, I'm excited for all of that. And I'm also really excited for the emotional vulnerability this brings us. We get to see emotional vulnerability a little bit in season one. Obviously, we see Simon opening up. We see more warmth coming in. But I think there's a tempestuousness. I don't know if that's the word I actually want. But I think that there is a, there's more depth in this book to be offered, specifically with both the overcoming of trauma storyline, not that Simon didn't overcome trauma. Simon obviously overcame trauma. But the way those are framed and the banter on top. And again, it depends how much they delve into those backstories. There's a really beautiful moment. Kate gets, Kate is terrified of thunderstorms and like in a really paralyzing way. There's a, a scene where they, at, at the house party where Kate goes to the library to get a book or the study or what have you. And a, a storm happens and she gets kind of trapped there and Anthony finds her cowering under this desk. And she is not in her right mind in the sense that she is not to her full wits. She's not capable of bantering with him and sparring with him verbally in the way that she usually is. And he just sits with her. And then after they're married, spoiler, there's a moment where there's a storm and they're in bed and she's asleep but struggling and he's awake and kind of trying to figure out what to do and help her through it. And he just like raises the blanket over her and is watching over her. And there's just such a gentleness to that and a softness to that. And then we, I mean, there's an event at the end as well, but we'll go there. But, but there's just these moments, right? So we get to see Anthony being an utter asshole. There are moments in this where he is an utter asshole. Like there's a moment where they're fighting in the library or I don't, I, I mean, I think it's a different scene. And at one point he like throws something on the ground that Kate is asking for or, or needs or wants, I don't remember. I think it's a key so that she has to bend over and pick it up. And it's just like these power plays. So there's that. But then there are these moments of utter softness. So I think that there's a lot there. And we see that a little bit in the first season, I think. And I, I think there's the struggle too with how much of Sienna they showed in the first season and how much of a romantic to make Anthony. Because obviously there are the book readers who are like, but Kate. So that is Anthony and Kate. They're going to be a delight. They're going to be amazing. I'm very, very excited to see who our Kate will be. And there's going to be a lot going on there. But that also begs the question then where we're going to stand with all of our other characters. So Simon and Daphne in particular, I think I would be interested to see expanded from the book. In the book, we get to see them the most during Pall Mall. And that is a delight. And they need to still be there. We get to see Daphne a lot sharper than we get to see her in this season. We get to see Simon kind of like amused and along for the ride with the Bridgertons. I think that there's a lot of opportunity to slip Simon in with the brothers. Like there's a scene in the book where the brothers are kind of with Anthony at the club, trying to get his head on straight in terms of his feelings for Kate. Anthony's main struggle is that he tells Kate before they get married that they're gonna be married, but love isn't gonna enter into it which is a hard thing to hear as someone about to be married and a little bit falling in love with your soon to be husband, that he is never gonna love you. That there will be respect and friendship potentially, but he is never going to love you. Like that sucks. So that's Anthony's struggle is getting his head out of his butthole and his brothers attempt to help with that. 
And I think that's a great place to, to swoop Simon in some more, especially as he's already like his best friend. So there, there's potential there. And clearly the audience wants more of Simon and Daphne. So I think that that will be a good place. I don't know if we'll see them getting a completely new storyline. It will also be interesting because we get the epilogue in season one of their child. In the book, obviously, you know, we go back a little bit. And Daphne, I think, is just pregnant during the Pall Mall game. So we'll see if they follow in that look, that respect as well. And if, if audiences can track that, which I think they can. I mean, we're not dumb. Benedict and Eloise don't get as much time in the book, if I'm remembering correctly, which kind of makes sense. Benedict is a little weird in the sense that he's the next book. So it's a little weird that we don't spend more time setting him up. So I can see, I can see this season giving him more to do. I just don't know where they may do that right now because I have not reread his book yet. So sorry. In terms of giving Eloise more screen time, because clearly she's a fan favorite, they're not going to just not do that. We'll see, I guess, if they keep her on the Lady Whistledown route. I could see them throwing Edwina in with her and Penelope. Then there's also the question of how Lady Whistledown is going to play in this. In the book, she drives a lot of this in the sense that she kind of focuses on Anthony a little bit more and Kate's reaction to the Whistledown column play into her reactions to Anthony, this and that and the other. Now that we know definitively who Lady Whistledown is in the show, there is going to have to be more intention behind that. It's not just a framing narrative device anymore, which sure, I don't, I think Julia Quinn had stuff going on behind the scenes in the books. But when I was reading the books, I wasn't really paying attention to whistle down in the same way. It was just kind of like the intro into the chapter and it gave me the backstory of what the hot gossip was, but I wasn't thinking about it in those active terms that I think now we're going to have to think about it. It's going to be like, okay, why is Penelope writing this? Is she trying to move things? Especially if we get that scene where Anthony saves her. We, we obviously know that she's emotionally attached to the Bridgerton, so it's going to be like, is she helping? Is she got something else going on? We don't know. And I don't know because none of this has happened yet. With Colin as well, we obviously see him going off at the end of season one. A whole year will have passed, so hopefully we'll get him back because he gets some of the best bits in this book. And I think he's kind of a fan favorite throughout. But we get to see him kind of ribbing Anthony as like only a younger brother who is of age can do. And like, he's the youngest brother of the brothers that are of age. So it makes sense that he's the one doing it. But he's the one who kind of puts Kate and Anthony in each other's paths because he can, he grasps right away. I don't think Kate makes it a secret that she's not about it with Ann or not about Anthony. And Colin is like, this is gonna be fun. So hopefully we get him back. I also think it's an opportunity to start establishing his traveling and his wanderlust, which we know by his book is a thing. So I think if we start peppering that in in a way that we still get him in the show, but then also have that development on the back end, that that would be compelling. So, and obviously I would like to see him and Penelope interact some more. I'll be really interested to see what they do with Lady Danbury because she's not going to be as active in the sense that they had her very emotionally close to Simon and and positioned as like Simon's kind of family of sorts. And But she's also like, you know, the leader of society. When she says get, you get, even if you're the queen. So I think in many ways she will be there still providing her excellent wit and commentary and almost acting as the audience's eye and the audience's voice within the show potentially because she's going to get a lot of those zingers in and we'll see. Also the fact that she is so close with Simon could be the show's way to bring her closer to the Bridgertons. I would like to see her and Penelope start to, to gravitate toward each other a little bit more because we know by Penelope's book that they kind of 
get along pretty well. So I would like to see, I wouldn't mind seeing that established early. Er. I don't know what they're going to do with the queen because she is new and I really don't know. It will be interesting to see if they put her or have her as in tune with Edwina as the diamond of her season as she was with Daphne. Maybe we'll get the prince back. I don't know that they would try and pair Edwina up with the prince instead of her, her scholar that she meets at the house party but maybe who knows as long as she gets her perfect ending I'm okay with it the Featheringtons I have no clue their whole plot is new I don't know I know that there's been a lot of speculation over who's gonna get the house I couldn't begin to tell you I hope that they get to stay though because there is a scene in the fourth book that I would very much like to see happen so as long as we get that scene do what you will, I guess. And I also think then that it will be interesting to kind of wrap this up too, to see how they structure the season. Season one was pretty obviously, you know, half and half in terms of the will they, won't they courtship, fake dating side of things, and then the, the marriage side of things. And I think that this season two would have similar opportunities, if you will, in terms of the structure. I think many of them would. Again, I don't remember Benedict super well, so he could be the outlier for a while. But of the books I read, I think that that could work for all of them. And I think it would, would work for this one. And especially because seeing them open up is going to take a little time, I think, to kind of happen. So I think that that would make sense to do kind of four episodes, banter, tension, sexual tension, wit, sparring verbally, and then four episodes of all of that, but they're married. And some blanket softness and some sexy times. So who knows? I'm very excited to see what they will do, what will happen. I, I don't know what they may add, what they may take away. And, oh, also Sienna, there is an opera singer in the book. So it will be interesting to see if that plays in a similar way to how it is in the book. Because in the book, there's an emotional distance. There's a, clearly a history there, but Anthony is not emotionally tied to that in the way that if we moved into that, revisiting that relationship immediately after this season, I think there would be a lot of feelings on his side, as much as he claims he doesn't have feelings, kind of. Um, so yeah, that will be interesting to see too. But I love Anthony and Kate together. I think this offers new opportunities to widen up the world. Now that we've got it firmly established, we'll get our loved characters, and then we'll get some more to love. I really, really love Kate and Edwina and Mary, and even the little dog whose name I can't remember. So yeah, in the meantime, I will go back to listening to Jonathan Richmond and the Modern Lovers buzz, 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 goes the honeybee, and tweedly, tweedly, twee go the birds. And you let me know what you're looking forward to in this season. What do you think is going to happen? What are the scenes or moments, if you read the books, that you are make or break for you? Like, have to be there? What are things that maybe you're willing to see them take a little bit more artistic liberties with? Because I think there is a strength in taking artistic liberties where it's going to serve the story they're telling, as long as it fits the characters, and if it, it fits the emotional tone of the show and makes sense, like, I don't have a problem with it, necessarily. But Paul Mall and B for me, are like, and I'm, I'm not pretending that I'm anything special in that assessment. I'm very much on the, on the trend of, of book readers on that one. But yeah, so season two, let's do it all again. But let me know and it'll be fun. Who knows? Maybe I'll even get on that subreddit. Probably not. But yeah. Cheers, have a great one, and I'll see you next time. Bye.